Good evening. Good evening. My, My name, name is John Roman. I am the publisher of the short of 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 I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. I know it's an exciting night as the election results start to come in. But I think a lot of people are also excited to not be thinking about that right now. So uh, we're fortunate about putting on the Women of Influence this evening. I did want to start out with a brief apology to all of this year's honorees. As many of you know, this event was originally scheduled to be held this spring as an in-person event. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to postpone the event to today with the hopes that the pandemic would be in a better spot. But as we all know, that is not the case. And so we are proceeding quite differently this evening than normal. We are recording live from the hotel at Kirkwood Center in Cedar Rapids. And instead of addressing three to 400 business and community leaders, there are only a handful of people in the ballroom. We are taking all of the necessary precautions to keep our honorees, speakers, and staff as safe as possible. This includes taking temperatures, wearing masks, and social distancing. We are, however, excited to share the awards ceremony with a much larger audience online. Our goal for this evening is, of course, to celebrate this year's honorees and in learning about their passions and journeys, foster the development of more women leaders in the corridor. In the past, we've often been asked if the honorees' acceptance speeches were recorded because they are so inspiring. We are recording the awards banquet this, this year, and we'll share the recordings with the registrants after the event. I encourage you to forward it on to friends, colleagues, and up-and-coming female leaders from throughout the corridor and beyond. At this time, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Without their financial support and input, we would not be able to host this special evening. The Women of Influence Awards are presented by the University of Iowa Tippie College of Business. Launch a new business, land that promotion, score a seat in the C-suite, whatever your career trajectory, the Iowa MBA can help you get there. The University of Iowa's Tippie College of Business provides three convenient programs for working professionals, explore their professional online and executive options to find your best fit, we're fortunate to have Don Kluber, Executive Director of the Executive MBA Programs at the University of Iowa Tippie College of Business, who is joining us online tonight to talk a bit more about these programs and to welcome all of you. So Don, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, John. Thank you to John Aspen and the whole team at the Corridor Business Journal for making this event possible. It is a much needed bright spot in a really tough year. I know I am very much looking forward to a time when our celebrations can once again, I don't know what that red thing is behind me, sorry about that, can once again be in large rooms full of well-wishers. I am here uh, representing the Tippy College of Business MBA programs for working professionals, particularly the Executive MBA program. That is a 16-month program for current and future leaders to learn in a cohort of their peers while continuing to work full-time. And it is such a pleasure to welcome you all here on this doubly auspicious day. Today is election day, of course, the day we make our voices heard. If you haven't yet voted, the polls are still open. Go ahead, we will wait. Oh, in the chat, John says we can't wait or we won't end on time. Oh, well, and if you know John and if you know the CBJ, you know that their events are always on time. So let us move on to the main event, which is honoring a group of exceptional women who have contributed so much in so many arenas. As I read the summaries of each honoree, I was struck by the scope of influence these women have had in their community, by the variety of the causes and organizations that they've championed, and the initiative they've taken to solve problems and fill unmet needs. I am really eager for you to meet them all, so let's get started. Thank you so much, Don. We are fortunate to have Collins Aerospace and Delta Dental of Iowa also sponsoring this uh, event this evening, and I'll tell you more about each of those companies a little bit later. The Corridor Business Journal hosted 15 events this year. The Women of Influence Award, however, is my favorite. This event has special meaning to the Corridor Business Journal and to me as it's the very first event we ever hosted 
back in 2005 after we launched the Corridor Business Journal in our basement in North Liberty. Over the past 15 years, we have recognized more than 150 female leaders from throughout the region. For those of you who are not familiar with this event, a few years ago, we added a new component to make the award presentations more personal. We invited one person who has been influenced by each of tonight's honorees to speak to their character and achievements. The honorees do not know that we have did this, and so we hope this will be a fun surprise. The videos will play after each honoree has been introduced. And after the presenter reads each of the honorees first name for the first time, we kindly ask them to come up on the stage. But new to this year, in addition to the 10 Women of Influence honorees, we are recognizing one emerging woman of influence. Presented by Delta Dental of Iowa, this inaugural award identifies one up and coming female leader who has not only achieved career success and recognition within her peer group, but is poised to take on a larger community-wide role in the years to come. Jeff Russell, the president and CEO of Delta Dental of Iowa, is joining us virtually tonight to present the award. For 50 years, Delta Dental of Iowa has been providing quality dental and vision benefits. As a not-for-profit health and wellness company, Delta Dental covers more than 1.2 million Iowans through individual plans, employer plans, and government programs. Healthy eyes, healthy smiles, healthy you. Visit deltadentalia.com to learn more. And Jeff, I'll turn the mic over to you. Thank you, John. Delta Dental is proud to sponsor this new award. The 2020 Emerging Woman of Influence is Megan Lehman. After graduating from the University of Iowa in 2016, Megan started working as a teller at Midwest One Bank. She was quickly promoted to personal banker and in July of 2018 was named Assistant Retail Manager of the Branch. Megan credits her rapid rise to a supportive team and she believes it's important to pay it forward with community service. For nearly seven years, she's volunteered for Big Brothers Big Sisters and in 2019 was named Big of the Year. She also takes annual mission trips to Guatemala, is a proud member of the Old Capital Kiwanis, and serves on the North Liberty Parks and Recreation Committee, as well as the Johnson County Dog Park Action Committee. Graduate school is likely in her future, as well as a run in politics, starting with the North Liberty City Council. I'd like to now play a video from Megan's Big Brothers Big Sisters MASH specialist, Mindy Paulson. I've known Megan Lehman since July of 2017 when I started working for Big Brothers Big Sisters. She is one of the matches on my caseload and she has been matched with her little sister since 2013. And they are a great team. They work well together. They have a lot of fun. Megan is accepted by the family and they all appreciate all of the things that she has done for her little sister. Her little sister recently told me when she was starting seventh grade that she felt confident and she felt like she was able to be willing to try new things in seventh grade and also not to take things so seriously and she felt that Megan's influence over the years has helped her reach that point, which is really awesome to hear. Megan's just a great outstanding young woman. Through work and just through life, she'll hear of um, free tickets to athletic events or other opportunities for our other volunteers. So she'll email me or call me and we can spread the word that way. She supports the agency through our fundraiser, Bowl for Kids' Sake. She's involved in her community. I know she's on the Parks and Rec um, Committee in North Liberty too. So again, just a really outstanding young woman. We're very happy that she is a big and involved with our agency. For those in the room and those joining us at home, please help me in congratulating Megan Lehman. Hello, my name is Megan Lehman and I am honored to be this year's Emerging Woman of Influence. 2020 has taught me a lot. For example, I've learned that there's no such thing as too many houseplants. <laughs> that your first attempt at a sourdough bread starter will be bad, and that there's no such thing as silence when you share your home with a corgi puppy. But 2020 has taught me more than that as well. It's taught me that there is still so much we have to 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 have to
And so I'm going to take the next few minutes to share with you just a little bit about what I'm going to First off, First I'm grateful to work for a car that I've done everything with its power to make sure I'm safe and I'm going to work for a car that I've done for those who for don't those know, who don't know me, me, I was a communication studies major at the University of Iowa who avoided numbers like she avoids COVID-19. We weren't friends. But Midwest One Bank saw potential in me to work and be successful in the financial industry. And because of their faith, I now have a career that I truly enjoy and a community of coworkers who support me. I'm very thankful to be a member of the Midwest One family. Secondly, I'm extremely grateful for the community of friends I have amassed over the years. And we needed each other more than ever this year, as I'm sure we all did. We had to get creative, but we found ways to support each other from socially distanced sidewalk or driveway chats to virtual Zoom game nights. We did get creative and we got a lot of laughs in along the way. Lastly, and most importantly, I'm thankful for my family. I will warn you, <laughs> I come from a long line of weepers. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to get through this portion of my speech weep free. <laughs> I rewrote this speech four or five times. I said I'd try. <laughs> I rewrote this speech four or five times discussing all that I've been able to do since coming here. But it all felt so ingenuous without the acknowledgement of the people who made this happen. And I know my mother is watching and this is your fault, mom. <laughs> First, I have two great sisters and a brother-in-law who are never too busy when I need them four incredible grandparents who have indulged my every quarantine hobby, and there have been a few, and done nothing but encourage me my entire life. And then I have the, the world's best parents who, even though they couldn't be here tonight as we planned, this honor is as much about them as it is about me Because without their example, gosh, man, I practiced and I could do this before. <laughs> without their example of endless faith, relentless persistence, and absolute love, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. I was very blessed to grow up in a home that taught me hard work will get you farther than anything else in life that service to others blesses more than just the served, and that in all circumstances, God is good. But God doesn't promise that all of our circumstances will feel good. And I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a living and breathing testament to that. But it's these hard circumstances and the uncomfortable situations that teach us how to be strong how to love our neighbors, and how to live with a gracious heart. And I wouldn't trade or give away those hard times for anything because it's what's helped bring me here today. I'm honored to just be in this room tonight, to be amongst this list of women who have done such amazing things, to the people who felt me worthy of this honor. I'll never be able to tell you how much you've encouraged me. So thank you very much. And a bigger thank you to the CBJ for finding a way for us to celebrate and celebrate safely. Thank you. Well, congratulations. And that's a, what a great way to kick off the evening this, this evening. And uh, Megan, we look forward to what you'll continue to accomplish in the corridor over the years to come. I would now like to invite Dawn Kluber back on the screen to present the first five Women of Influence Awards. Dawn, I'll turn it back over to you again. Thanks, John. We'll go in reverse alphabetical order this year. Let's get started. 
The first award goes to Millie Youngquist. Millie's passion for community service has blossomed since retiring from her 38 year career teaching choral music. A month after leaving her job at Washington County Schools, Millie found herself serving as executive director of the Community Foundation of Washington County. Under her purview, the number of endowment funds has doubled in the last eight years. As successful people tend to do, she's also found many other opportunities to serve. Millie sits on the Washington City Council, is president of the Washington chapter of the American Association of University Women, and she's president of the Washington Area Performing Arts and Events Center Advisory Committee. When Millie isn't championing causes that she cares about, she enjoys spending time with her husband, Bob, two daughters, and two grandchildren. I'd now like to play a video from Millie's friend and mentee, Jaron Rosie. Congratulations to Millie Youngquist for being recognized as a woman of influence. I've had the privilege of knowing Millie as an educator, as a wonderful mother to my good friend, Heather Youngquist, and as a leader in our community. Millie consistently puts service above self. As a volunteer for our city's 175th celebration, as a member of PEO, as the director of our county's community foundation, and where I work with Millie most closely as a city councilor and as a leader of our pursuit to be designated an Iowa great place for the city of Washington. It is my privilege to say thank you to Millie Youngquist for her service, keep up the good work, and congratulations for this recognition as a woman of influence. Those in the ballroom and those watching from home, please help me congratulate Millie Youngquist. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Millie Youngquist. I am honored, incredibly honored, to be named as one of Eastern Iowa's 2020 Women of Influence. Thanks to the Corridor Business Journal for establishing this award and for bringing us here tonight for this official recognition, even in the midst of a COVID epidemic. I would venture to say that all of us have been honored by our own communities and our organizations for our work, but to be recognized in this larger way is truly meaningful. It has been inspiring and motivating to read about the other honoree, honorees and to finally meet them in person. Many thanks to Isabella Santoro of Cafe Dodici for submitting my application and others who wrote recommendation letters. Jaron Rosine, Washington's mayor, whom we just heard from, Michelle Redlinger, director of Washington's Chamber of Commerce, Dr. Sam Massey of Iowa City's First Presbyterian Church, and Laura Booth, donor relations officer at the Greater Cedar Rapids Community Foundation. Thanks also to my husband, Bob, and my daughters, Heather and Holly, for being my cheerleaders and my best advocates. You may have never been to Washington, Iowa, a small city of about 7,600 on the southern end of Eastern Iowa's Creative Corridor, but I'm thankful that this award will bring it to your attention. We're a community with a rich past, a vibrant present, and a promising future. We're located conveniently just 30 miles south of Iowa City in Coralville, yet we retain our individual identity and have an amazing number of amenities for a city of our size. Much of my work in my second phase of life after my first retirement has been in community development, whether it's been as the executive director of the Community Foundation of Washington County or on the Washington City Council. I'm thankful that our city council is not like Washington DC and so political, but we are not political and we can see the direct results of our actions and decisions. Whether it's a remodeled city hall, a new water treatment plant, or a grant to renovate older homes, we get to make and see things happen. My community foundation work has opened new worlds of working with nonprofits and donors to establish endowment funds. These funds will continue to benefit Washington County residents forever. As Warren Buffett once said, someone sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree years ago. Uh, another saying goes, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. 
Congratulations to all women of influence tonight. Good luck with your tree planting. Our world is hurting and is in great need of our messages, our leadership, and our influence. God bless you as you continue your work. Thank you. The next award goes to Deb Deborah Worm, the Assistant Vice President at FNM Bank. Deborah's influence can be seen in the women and girls she's met in the corridor. When female students at Kenwood Leadership Academy wore men's clothes to dress like a leader day, Deborah co-founded Leaders Who Lunch. The program connects lady leaders and female students each month to discuss goal setting, leadership, and career aspirations. Since the program was founded, Deborah has also partnered with Women Lead Change to facilitate the Power Leaders Lunch, a networking luncheon held for women every other month. With the bank's support, Deborah rarely misses an opportunity to network and volunteer. She's active in the Professional Women's Network, the Economic Alliance Ambassadors Program, Junior Achievement, and United Way. Deborah also enjoys spending time with her husband, Roger, and four children. I'd now like to play a video from Deborah's friend and Leader to Lunch partner, Brooke Fitzgerald. Deb, so happy for you to be receiving this honor. You have influenced so many women in this community and beyond, many of whom are here tonight supporting you. Woohoo! And not only women in our community, but girls through the Kenwood Leadership Academy Leaders Who Lunch. Many of those girls will forever hold you in their heart until they're grown women and keep that influence in them. Thank you so much for all that you do for our community and congratulations on this incredible honor. Please help me congratulate Deborah Warren. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to congratulate everybody. Um, it's, it's a pretty amazing award and especially Megan at your age to be recognized. You're obviously doing something right and your parents I'm sure are very proud of you. I um, also want to thank the Corridor Business Journal for recognizing um, these women and um, the efforts that they make to lead a positive life and have positive change in their community. I would like to thank FNM Bank. Um, it's an amazing organization and they are so supportive of my efforts. They're so generous with my time, allowing me to go out into the community and really to make a difference. It's great to work for an organization that has that same mindset and um, in their heart as I do. And of course, I want to thank the beautiful women that nominated me for this award and wrote letters on my behalf. It goes without saying that none of what I do would be possible without these women. Um, they're my friends, they're my professional um, cheerleaders, and I just love all of them. Um, I would consider myself more of a connector and a doer than I would an influencer. But if I am an influencer, it's more through action and impact than a conscientious effort to influence. There's countless women in this, in, in this community that are more than willing to give of themselves to help others. And if I can connect them with someone, or if I can um, give them an opportunity that leads to something great, for me, that's success. Um, so many women have influenced me and positively impacted my life. I have women that challenge me to step up and be a good community member. I have women that challenge me to embrace my personal journey and know that it's made me who I am today. I have women that challenge me to grow spiritually and not be afraid to speak the truth as I see it. And I have women that challenge me to be a leader at home and at work. Most importantly, I have women that challenge me to look outward and see others. These influ influencers made me a better person. My goals are simple. I just want to lift others up and I want to help people, especially young females, as Brooke said. I want to give them the opportunity to um, have personal growth through things that we do with them. It's usually just a moment in time, but I really believe those moments can have a positive impact on them and really can change their life for the better. All the women that I spoke of earlier are involved in my Leaders Who Lunch program and this program really is dear to my heart. 
it's simple. We get together and we have um, lunch with students from Kenwood Leadership Academy in Cedar Rapids. And we just talk. We talk about life and we talk about careers and, and just get to know each other a little bit. One question that always comes up is, what do you wanna be when you grow up? The answers are everything from a doctor to a writer to president of the United States. There are no boundaries for these young women and the possibilities are endless, mostly because no one has said to them, you're not smart enough, you're not strong enough, and women just don't do that. The possibilities are endless. But we all know that in some point in the years ahead, they are going to get messages that will make them question their dreams, and ultimately, their once endless possibilities will narrow and their answers become more practical and limited. Messages from the media, from their peers, and even unintentionally from the adults that are around them. It should not be this way, and it does not have to be this way. We are all influencers on some level, at home, at work, and in our personal lives. This is a very powerful thing, and I hope that we all take this, um, I hope we all take that power seriously. I would ask that your communication and actions do not, do not narrow the possibilities of those around you. Do not give others a reason to question their dreams or stop short of where they want to go. Encourage them with the same excitement that you would encourage the young girl that says she wants to be president of the United States. Let them know that with hard work and tenacity, they can do anything and that they can achieve even the unachievable. If we can all do this, and we can all encourage someone to reach for the stars, the possibilities will once again become endless and there will be no boundaries. Wouldn't it be great to know that your actions and your words led to someone doing something that they were meant to do? Thank you again, and I promise to keep up the good work and to honor this award in the spirit that it was intended. Thank you. The next recipient is Kelly Tieslink. In college, Kelly fell in love with running and learning how it transformed her body. She began volunteering with Girls on the Run and has continued to do so for 14 years, including the past two as executive director of Girls on the Run of Eastern Iowa. Under her leadership, participation increased 43% and the organization has expanded into Black Hawk County. In addition, Kelly founded the first local chapter of Trail Sisters, the organization encourages participation in trail running through inspiration, education, and empowerment. She facilitates weekly group runs to grow the community of trail runners and continue to share her love of running. Kelly's personal achievements include running the Grand Canyon rim to rim and winning first place in the 2019 Superior 100 Mile Race. I'd like to now play a video from Kelly's former Girls on the Run coach, Charity Nebbe. I'm Charity Nebbe, and through my work with Iowa Public Radio and Iowa PBS, I get the opportunity to meet so many people, so many wonderful people. And then there are those extraordinary people, the people that really stand out, that have an almost indefinable spark for fire. And Kelly Tieslink is one of those people. She is so deserving of this honor. She is so committed to making life better for girls and women in Iowa. She walks the walk, she talks the talk, and she is willing to be tough when she needs to be tough. She's willing to be vulnerable and share her own story in an effort to reach others who may have similar struggles and also to help people write their own stories. She is a powerful, enthusiastic, brilliant, wonderful woman. And I know that she has the endurance to get the job done. If you can run a hundred miles, you can reach thousands and thousands of girls. And Kelly, I'm so proud to know you and to be your friend. And I'm so excited that you're receiving this honor. And I have just one thing to say, you're fantastic. Please help me congratulate Kelly Teasling. 
Thank you so much. And Charity, I hope you're watching. Thank you so much for that lovely intro. Um, that is gonna leave me smiling for a long time. But there was nobody at my table to tell me if I had food in my teeth. So I really, really hope I don't. Um, but if I do, who cares? Uh, so thank you so much um, for this evening to Corridor Business Journal for hosting um, tonight. I know it was a lot of hard work and a lot of pivoting. I know we're using that word a lot, but I am so happy to be here amongst all these amazing women here tonight. Um, I am going to start by reading an excerpt from a book called Enough As She Is. It's a little hard to hear, um, and sometimes I have a tough time getting through it, uh, but I promise that uh, it will get better. A large body of research tells us that differences in how girls and boys are raised lead girls to behave, feel, and even think differently than boys, and in ways that can make adolescence uniquely challenging for them. By age six, anxiety will be twice as prevalent among girls as boys. As a girl encounters or enters adolescence, she will be twice as likely as her brother to suffer from depression. She will perceive stress more often than her male peers. She will get less sleep. Her self-esteem will drop across a range of domains in her sports, in her appearance, and self-satisfaction, just to name a few. Some of her depression will be caused by overthinking her every move. Should I have said that in class? Is she mad at me? Which will shut her motivation and limit her problem-solving skills. Some will be caused by the self-criticism that girls are more likely to visit on themselves. And some will be caused by shame, the unshakable feeling that she is an unworthy person, an emotion that emerges in adolescence and follows her into adulthood. By late adolescence, her self-compassion will decline to its lowest level of any group of youth. During this period, her body will change in ways that may make her uncomfortable and self-critical. A girl will gain an average of 40 pounds of body fat and she will be pulled away from the thin ideal nearly everyone her, around her demands her that she fulfill. She will engage in self-objectification -objectiv or excess body monitoring, which is linked to eating disorders, depression, body shame, academic trouble, impaired personal relationships, and even diminished political action on college campuses. I'll stop there. I could go on, but I won't. I think we get the picture. And I think, unfortunately, that this is all pretty real for, for many of us in this room. I guarantee that every women, woman who received the Women of Influence Award here tonight can relate to something that I just read. And this excerpt doesn't even touch on the particular cha challenges that a girl of color faces. But now I want to read from a college application essay from a young woman named Olivia, who I had the honor of coaching for four years at Girls in the Run. Um, she is now a, a freshman at Tufts University um, and she has grown into an amazing young woman. Here's what she wrote in her college application essay. After years of anticipation, I had finally reached third grade and was old enough to join Girls in the Run at my school. We trained for a 5K by running laps around school, but the real purpose of the program was to develop my self-worth and to teach me how to circumvent the insecurity that was so common among my peers. I learned how to address conflict, how to respect myself and those around me. The lesson that remains with me most vividly, however, is the visualization of unplugging from my mind, the negative cord full of self-deprecating thoughts and feelings and plugging in the positive cord, glowing with reminders of my worth. At the end of the season, each girl was celebrated for her success, not just because she ran a 5K, but for the exceptional unique qualities that she developed throughout the program and brought to her team. I left Girls in the Run at the end of sixth grade with a wealth of knowledge worth far more, than, more to me than my physical fitness. I am so proud and grateful to work for an organization that prevents, that works to prevent the stats that I shared from enough as she is. I'm guessing many of us here tonight in person or virtually didn't have girls in the run as a young girl and could very well still benefit um, from the lessons that we teach at Girls in the Run and could also be, be, be suffering from low self-esteem, from negative self-talk, or imposter syndrome. 
I grew up thinking that my value was based on my looks, um, in particular, my weight. Thankfully, I found running, um, and eventually I found Girls in the Run. Both helped undo years of self-doubt and self-judgment, but the best part, I also found supportive, strong, empowering women who lifted me up and helped me view myself through their eyes. These women gave me what Girls in the Run could have. Every girl should receive the messages and lessons that Olivia did through Girls on the Run. And while I wish this was possible, it's just unfortunately not. So what can we do to help women and girls realize their potential? First of all, I think that we should all commit to supporting organizations who provide girls and women with critical resources that will help um, of help them avoid being a statistic, whether that's Girls on the Run or organizations like the Iowa Women's Foundation, um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, House of Hope. There are a lot of amazing organizations in our community that are working to impact women and girls. And I also want to invite others to support the women around you, lift them up, help them recognize when they're using negative self-talk, help them recognize their self-worth, um, give them kudos for working hard and taking care of themselves, whatever that looks like for them. And if you needed to be lifted up, call me because I am forever grateful to the women in my life who I've met through Girls in the Run and running and my profession. I will never turn down an opportunity to influence others in the same way that I have in, been impacted by so many women in my life. To everyone that I've worked with at Girls in the Run, my fellow coaches, board members, past and present, volunteer staff, you are changing the lives of girls right here in Eastern Iowa. I am so grateful for your commitment to empowering girls and that I get to work with you to empower girls every day. To my trail sisters, um, also known as the women that I spend countless miles with in the woods while talking about nothing and everything, you are my girls on the run. You inspire me to be my best self, to show up for others and also myself. I learn from your hard work as mothers, as professionals and badass runners. I hope I can say that. Um, thank you to each and every one of you for being exactly you and for influencing me. And to the other Women of Influence honorees here tonight, thank you for doing your part to influence and lift others up around you. Thank you. The next recipient is Patty Seda. Patty is the owner of Seda Consulting, a coaching firm for individuals and teams who seek to be their professional best. Prior to starting her company, Patty held multiple executive level positions and her experiences have led her to be the accomplished business leader she is today. Focused on developing people, Patty also created Pace Setters, a four day summer camp for eighth and ninth grade students. The camp explores the corridor's resources, volunteer opportunities, and ways that future leaders can invest in their community. She leads by example. Patty participates in Go Red for Women, Leaders Who Lunch, and College Community School District. As if she didn't have enough on her plate, Patty published her first book, Discovering Job Joy, Your Guide to Stretching Without Snapping, this year. And she's a proud wife, mother, and grandmother. I'd like to now play a video from Patty's friends, Lindsay Leahy, Stacey Osako, and Amy Reisner. <laughs> I'm Lindsay Leahy and I nominated Patty for Woman of Influence along with my friends Stacey Osako and Amy Reisner and many other Patty uh, fans. And here are the top three reasons that we nominated her. I nominated Patty due to her passion for the community and raising future leaders, particularly raising up women in our community. I nominated Patty because she's genuinely motivated to help us all be our best selves and to feel fulfilled at work and at play. And I nominated Patty because she isn't afraid to give critical feedback and she challenges all the people that she loves and brings the best wine to parties. We are so happy that Patty has been recognized as the woman of influence we know and love. Congratulations, Patty. Please help me congratulate Patty Seda. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't see that coming. So um, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, ever since I was a little girl, I thought influence and leadership was about being bold and loud. 
And it was even better when you had a microphone and a stage. Like that, that's just all the things I loved. And I remember my mom saying on more than one occasion, Patty, you don't have to be a ringleader all the time. And in her defense, it was usually after I had influenced my girly girlfriends um, to do something we probably shouldn't have done. That whole thought of being loud and on a stage to be a leader was reinforced when I was in high school and I was a drum major. And even though they didn't give me a microphone or a megaphone, which is probably a good idea, they gave me a really big baton and a really loud whistle and put me up on a riser where I could get hundreds of people to do what I wanted them to do through that influence. And even in my career, my, when I was first getting into my career, the accolades and the promotions were usually based on being really bold and taking a stand and being on a stage and having a microphone, whether it was literally or figuratively through being able to have policies and, and send emails to lots of people. And if you look at the political ads that have been going on for days, weeks, months, it feels like years, <laughs> it would seem that the loudest voices are the most influential. But when I really think about the people who have influenced me, it would seem that influence happens in the quiet. When I think of the people who influenced me early in my career, there was Pat, who was always by my side, who was always encouraging me and believing in me way more than I believed in myself at that time. There was Art that I vividly remember after one meeting, he had me stay afterwards. And he said, I just, I just wanna catch up on a few things. I'm like, okay. And he gave me some really direct feedback that at the time was really hard to receive, but I'm very grateful that he had the courage to do that. I think of Kim, who over the 30 years that I've called her my mentor has never told me once what to do when I desperately wanted her to tell me what to do, she would just ask questions and then ask more questions and more questions and dig deeper and deeper until I figured out what the right answer was. When I think about the youth camp that I started back in 2008 with teenagers, you all know that if you have teenagers, you can't get them to do something by lecturing them you can influence them by showing them different things in the community, by listening to what they have to say is important. And through that, you get teenagers to clean a toilet. <laughs> so mom, I'm gonna be a ringleader. It's just who I am. But I don't think the ringleader has to be in the ring with the whistle, with the microphone, with the whip. I think the ringleader needs to be on the outside of the ring where they're encouraging and they're listening and they're asking a lot of questions and they don't have to be the loudest voice in the room. So I want to say cheers to all of you. Cheers and thank you to CBJ for, um, as someone said before, pivoting and repivoting and repivoting and really being an amazing leader ever since the pandemic hit and getting people together and helping them move forward. I wanna thank all you women who are home um, cheering us on and that little group that's on the Northeast side cheering us on. I also wanna thank my husband, Dan, and my kids and my grandkids. And I wanna thank all of you for being with us tonight and for the ringleaders in this room. So cheers. The next recipient is Leslie Nolte.
Since she opened Nolte Academy in 2000, Leslie has grown the business from a shoestring operation with just 38 students and four teachers into a premier arts institution, employing more than 30 specialized instructors serving 1,100 students. In addition to Nolte Academy, Leslie founded one-of-a-kind programs like the Performing Arts Preschool and the Open Door Dance Festival. She produces the Englert Theater's annual production of The Nutcracker, as well as original productions like Newsies, and has racked up awards for her commitment to community arts and culture, and even makes time for guest lecturing at the UI's Tippy College of Business. It's a lot for a mother of five. When asked how she does it, she's quick to thank her husband, Mark, for standing beside her. I'd now like to play a video from Leslie's former Nolte Academy student and current student at Juilliard, Matilda Mackey. There was a time I don't remember well because I was around two years old and my memories don't go back that far. I was diaper clad, bald, dancing at your studio and I was obsessed with hiding at this point in my life. So I decided to scare all the adults inadvertently and hide behind a fish tank in your office. And apparently everyone was out running on the strip, going on the highway, like searching for this lost child. And I was just there the whole time. It's moments like that, that I know I was at home dancing at Nolte and it will be a home for many to come and for me forever. And I love you, Leslie. Thank you for everything. Please help me congratulate Leslie Nolte. Good evening, everyone. My name is Leslie Nolte, and I'm sorry I cannot be there with you tonight, but I'm so honored to be part of this group of women. I just want to say a huge thank you to the CBJ and all of the colleagues and partners and friends that wrote letters for this honor. And to my whole team at Nolte Academy, nothing we've done over the last 21 years has been me, myself, and I. Our team, our group, our collaborations around the community are what brings me joy and, and all of our successes. So I just wanna say thank you. It is my goal as a teacher to really encourage and inspire the next generation of leaders and creative people. And during this time of the pandemic, creativity and arts have really been the thing that have saved me and what I feel like our students as well. So every day we'll go into the studio and I will continue to teach as best as I can and really hope these young people, well, these young people will be the influencers of our future. Thank you again so much. Have a wonderful evening and happy day. Congratulations, Leslie, and then thank you, Dawn, for presenting those first five awards. Here to pre present the final five awards to Cindy Dietz, the State Government Relations at Collins Aerospace or RTX. If you tried to add up all the contributions that women make in the workforce and in their communities, you'd never be done. Collins Aerospace sees it every day in the corridor. Collins Aerospace would like to congratulate all of the women nominated for and selected as Women of Influence this year. Please help me welcome Cindy Dietz to present the next five awards. Thank you. The next honoree tonight is Nancy Humbles. Nancy began her career in student support and equity leadership at the Marion Learning Center before ultimately joining the University of Iowa in 1997. After a decade at the Tippy College of Business, Office of the Provost, and later Opportunity at Iowa, she was promoted to director of the UI Center for Diversity and Enrichment. In this role, she coordinated outreach opportunities and resources for underserved students. Well, since retiring in 2014, Nancy hasn't slowed down. She's currently serving her second year as president of the Cedar Rapids Community School District Board of Education. And she volunteers for the Area Substance Abuse Council, African American Museum of Iowa, and Tanager Place LGBTQ Advisory Board, among other positions. Of all the lives she's impacted, Nancy is most proud of her three children with husband Shelby Humbles Jr. I'd like to now play a video from Nancy's fellow volunteer, and 2014 Woman of Influence, Leslie Wright. I am so thrilled to be um, part of honoring Nancy Humbles as a woman of influence. 
Certainly she has influenced me and so many people in this community. Um, one of the things that struck me in writing about Nancy for this honor was watching her video where she asked herself, have I made a difference today? Um, it inspired me, it continues to inspire me. Um, in every encounter with Nancy, I have experienced her as an activist and a champion. Um, and she shows up for the things that she cares about and challenges the rest of us to do the same. Um, she has um, touched the lives of children, of school board, of the University of Iowa community, her reach is long. Uh, I know that she will continue to influence all of us long into the future, and I'm grateful to know her. Thanks for all you do, Nancy, and congratulations. Honorees in the ballroom and everyone watching from home, please help me congratulate Nancy Humbles. Good evening, everyone. I am pleased, honored, and humbled to accept the 2020 CBJ Women of Influence Award and to join past recipients. I am also blessed to be surrounded by tonight's honorees, a strong group of female leaders who are forward thinkers and change makers in their own right. Thank you to the committee, Vice President Jennifer Borchardine, of the Cedar Rapids Community School District Board of Directors for nominating me and my former colleagues and friends that supported my nomination. I sincerely thank each of you for helping me reach a stage where I can proudly hold up this award as a mark of my accomplishments. I am earnestly grateful for the recognition I have received for my work. As a young black woman growing up in, Des Moines, in the Des Moines community, my parents, Albert and Evelyn Kyer, instilled in me and my siblings at a young age that if we worked hard and did the right thing, the benefits would outweigh the challenges that may lay ahead. Serving as my first role models, my parents led by example and worked hard, and my father and mother often worked two jobs. Although they did not have a formal education, they would always say, get your education. If you get your education, you won't have to work this hard. I listened to my parents' advice and obtained my BA from the University of Northern Iowa and my MA from the University of Iowa. And while I'm not sure I would agree with them about not having to work hard, I have never regretted this decision, not once. The road that led me here was not without challenges along the way, but each one of them has only strengthened me and molded me into the person I am today, a strong woman who knows exactly what she wants, someone who sets her eyes on a goal and does not lose sight of it until it is achieved. With great privilege, I stand before you as the president of the Cedar Rapids Community School District Board of Directors and president of the African American Museum of Iowa. These roles have allowed me to serve as an advocate for students of the district and a role model for brown and black boys and girls in our community, state, and country. Education has been the key to my success, to the success of my children, and to the success of those who I have worked with over the years. Education is not only a pathway towards better employment, it is a way for us as a community to have enlightened conversations, to share ideas and plans, and to grow towards a better tomorrow. I want to thank my husband, Shelby, of 40, 47 years, and our children, Heather, Shelby, and Shamara. Shelby has been my champion and longtime supporter. There were times in my life that I wanted to throw in the towel, but he encouraged me to push on. Every single day, 
you have an ability to influence the people you come in contact with, even if it's a stranger. Make that impact a great one. Make it a positive one. You can make a difference in someone's lives. Lastly, thank you for your time and for the opportunity to share my enthusiasm for education. Together as a community, we can use our education, both experiential and formal, to build a more equitable future. Thank you. The next award goes to Faye Hoover. As a district court judge for Iowa's sixth judicial district, Faye Hoover is known for treating others with respect and kindness. Her friendly demeanor puts litigants at ease during what is usually a difficult time in their life. This is especially true for children in the middle of custody battles. Judge Hoover's passion to serve marginalized populations has made a big difference in the drug treatment court program, which aims to help those with criminal and substance abuse issues overcome challenges. She sees the value in every person and her ability to connect with each client has changed the way many of them view the judicial system. Another example of her passion to serve is her role leading the Pro Se Divorce Clinic, which helps provide services to those who cannot afford an attorney. In every role that Judge Hoover fills, she is known for her respect and kindness towards all involved. Here now is a video from Faye's friends and nominators, Corey Goldensoff and Caitlin Slesser. I still remember attending Judge Hoover's investiture as a young attorney in 2007 when she first became a judge. At that time, there were few female judges in the area and it was a notable event. 13 years later, she is still only one of two female district court judges in our district. And so in that position, she serves as an important role model for female attorneys and aspiring judges. Judge Hoover has many good qualities, but the one mentioned most by those who know her is the kindness and dignity with which she treats everyone in her courtroom. This doesn't mean she's not speaking with authority, but she always recognizes the humanity of the people who are bringing their problems for her to decide. Judge Faye has been in public service her entire career. She started off with legal aid and then she became a public defender and she's been a judge for many years. Now in 2007, she became the judge for the Lynn County Drug Court, which means I get to work with her on a very close basis pretty much every week because I'm the defense attorney for the drug court. Thank you for everything that you do, Judge Hoover, for this community, and thank congratulations. Please help me congratulate Faye Hoover. Well, Judge Hoover, <clears throat> excuse me, was unable to make it this evening, but she did send a few words that I'm going to read right now. I am honored and humbled by the recognition. The work I have been able to do with the drug treatment court has been the most rewarding and at times challenging I have performed as judge. Providing time and resources to people living with substance abuse, substance use disorders is an evidence-based intervention that is also humane. I am inspired again and again by the individuals working through the program. Thank you for the honor and the recognition. Our next recipient is Libby Gottschall Slappy. For more than 30 years, Libby has been devoted to strengthening nonprofits and building community. Libby's mark can be seen all across Cedar Rapids. Her fundraising efforts played a key role in the establishment of the Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival and Nubo City Market. As a founder of Young Parents Network, Libby worked hard to lead, network, and grow the organization in her nine years on the board of directors. Most recently, Libby put her connections and experience to use as a development director of Kids First Law Center. Responsible for the fundraising program, her success directly benefited the nonprofit's mission to give children a voice in divorce and custody conflicts. Libby is committed to her community and is described as having a connection for everything. She has volunteered for dozens of other nonprofits and enjoys being a mentor to those looking for guidance. I'd like to now play a video from Libby's friend and 2015 woman of influence, Hillary Livengood.
Good evening. My name is Hilary Livengood, and I am honored to introduce you to Libby Slappy, a woman I have been blessed to call a mentor, a professional colleague, a fellow volunteer, and a dear friend. Libby's husband, Charles, teaches online classes at Mount Mercy University. At the start of each semester, he asks his students to make a video to introduce themselves to one another. In that video, he invites them to showcase objects that are important in their lives. So we're gonna do the same for Libby. Libby's faith is foundational in her life. We're filming this in the narthex at Christ Episcopal Church, where most Sundays you'll find Libby greeting members and making newcomers feel at home. Libby is also an interfaith person. She and Charles are active volunteers with the Interreligious Council of Lynn County. Libby is a proud 1974 graduate of Coe College. As an alumna and a former employee, Libby is one of the school's best cheerleaders. Go Coe! Libby, you're a dear friend. And even though you've been known to call these awards women under the influence, I promise you that you indeed are a woman of influence because that's who you are in my life. Congratulations. Please help me now in congratulating Libby Slappy. Thank you, Hillary, for your very generous remarks. And thank you to my sweet husband, Charles, for your help and cameo appearance in the video. And Jenny Schultz at Kids First Law Center, thank you for spearheading my nomination. And to my longtime dear friends, Nancy Lowenberg, Kathy Caden, Fran Hansen, Hillary Livengood, thank you for your kind letters of support. I love you all. When my mother was born in 1923, it was a close call. She weighed less than three pounds at birth and her twin brother who weighed less than she did not survive. Each week, my grandmother meticulously recorded my mother's weight in her baby book and stopped at seven months when my mother weighed in at a strapping 11 pounds. In the 85 years my mom was on this earth, she was her own person, a true rule breaker to be sure. You see, in South Carolina in the 1920s and 30s, the expectation for any female child was clear. She should master meticulous manners, speak when spoken to, using of course the requisite yes ma'ams, yes sirs, and perfect grammar, exhibit poise and polish at every turn, and ultimately marry and raise a family in order to repeat the cycle all over again. And how did this work for my mother? I think you can guess. When she was sent off to Gulf Park School in Mississippi, it was believed the staff there could inculcate the Southern propriety that was lacking in one Margaret Sutherland Arrington. Never one to step away from a challenge, that's where my mom picked up smoking and drinking. She was 14. She got kicked out. My grandparents didn't give up though and sent her to Gunston Hall School for Women in Washington, DC, where she stayed and graduated. And she was even elected president of the senior class. Sadly, hers was the last class to graduate. The school then closed and is now a parking lot next to a liquor store, alas. Next stop for mom, the Big Apple where she honed her independence chops, living on her own for the first time. She worked for the telephone company, emptying money from the pay phones all over the city. She loved it. She was personally accompanied by an armed guard and she got to see a lot of New York City. Shortly after she returned to South Carolina, she met a handsome army private who was stationed in Greenville before his deployment overseas. He promised to write, which he did, and their correspondence courtship resulted in a proper Southern wedding on May 20th, 1946. And you need to know it was a mixed marriage. My mother was from the South and my father was from the North. But only that adventuresome drinking and smoking mother of mine could possibly have had the moxie to move North of the Mason Dixon line and start a new life as the wife of a steel worker. Her Southern debutante life was a distant memory. I often think about how different mom's life would have been had she stayed in New York. What if she had fended off the heavy handed expectations of my Southern grandparents? Am I glad she was a stay at home mother of three in a small town in Ohio? Well, you bet, I was number three. For me being the youngest and the only daughter was like winning the lottery. 
and mom and I were a dynamic duo. We were as much sisters as we were mother and daughter. 18 years under the same roof, her influence was like osmosis. It was that unconscious transfer of grace, guts, and guile, seasoned liberally with humor. It was respect and kindness toward everyone, regardless of their station in life. It was the impact of red lipstick and red nail polish, and knowing the importance of a properly fitting bra. More than anything else though, it was the self-confidence that any female needed then and needs now to compete in this world still disproportionately run by old white Christian men. Upon retiring from his four plus decades at Republic Steel, my father had no plans for how to occupy his time. So my mother informed him that she was now going to get a job, which prompted his retort, who would hire you? And without missing a beat, she responded, watch me. And she immediately found employment. So tonight is a salute to my mother, Margaret Sutherland Arrington Gotchell. Thanks for everything, mom. I'm so glad I watched you. The next award this evening goes to Bridie Criswell. After a 17 year career as a public school educator, Bridie resigned in hopes of finding a better way to develop children's minds, bodies, and spirits. The Good Earth Organization was born. Now in its fourth year, the Good Earth is a nature-based education center for children ages four to seven. Parents like that their kids spend time outdoors and this promotes better learning and stimulates creativity. However, the real magic is Bridie. She has a way of reaching children where they're at, and parents say watching Bridie teach shows them how to better interact with their own kids. Bridie also hosts parenting classes, family yoga, and summer camps with a wait list four years deep. Bridie is revered by many as an innovative and courageous leader and educator for children and parents. And now here's a video from Nicole Eden, whose children attend the Good Earth. Heidi, your community is so grateful for who you are and what you've created. We asked a few of your friends some questions about you and the good earth. Here are their responses. We love the good earth. Okay. What is Miss Bridie's superpower? One thing you learned at the good earth. Some is actually a big skull. Jumping jacks. You learned how to do jumping jacks? Yeah. Good. People don't know how to do jumping jacks. Playing in the mud kitchen and in the hideout. My favorite thing to do on the farm is check out the dogs there when they are babies. Oh, yeah. And me too. We love you, Miss Friday! Please help me congratulate Bridie Criswell. The final award tonight goes to Lanisha Cassell, Executive Director of the African American Museum of Iowa. In the polarizing culture we live in, Lanisha understands the pivotal role that museums play. She pushes relevant and socially minded themes and uses her position to educate the public and promote dialogue. She has opened doors for youth and adult engagement through partnerships with Metro High School, Iowa Big, and Hancher Auditorium. Another important aspect of Lanisha's job is raising funds. And under her leadership, the History Makers Gala the only event in Iowa that specifically celebrates the achievements of Iowa's African-American history makers has set record attendance and raised increased funds every year. This is a direct result of Lanisha's drive and relationships in the community. 
She stays involved through service on the boards of Aging Services, Marion Cares, and the Cedar Rapids Metro YMCA. Lanisha is also a CBJ 40 Under 40 alumna. I'd like to now play a video from Lanisha's friend and African American Museum board member, Ben Hoover. Good evening, everyone. Lanisha, congratulations on this well-deserved honor. I'm very proud to have been part of the nomination process. I personally have, have witnessed Lanisha's dedication to this community while serving on the board of the African American Museum of Iowa. Lanisha, you brought us, brought us through some pretty, pretty dark times and out the other side. It's been an absolute honor to work with you on the board and I look forward to continue, continuing to see where you lead us in the future. Congratulations, Lanisha. Please help me congratulate Lanisha Cassell. Good evening. What an honor it is for me to be here with you all tonight. It's my pleasure and with a spirit of gratitude that I accept this recognition as an influencer in our communities. As a respected publication and news leader, the Corridor Business Journal has been an instrumental resource for me in showcasing examples of diversity in leadership since I re relocated to Iowa from the Washington DC area about 16 years ago. So thank you to John and Aspen Lohman and the CBJ for making an effort to highlight my contribution and that of my fellow honorees tonight as we all strive to make a difference in our organizations and communities. Thank you for embracing my role in the community. And what a plus it is to share tonight's stage with such dynamic leaders, all amazing women who deserve our recognition. I am especially pleased to share this honor with one of my mentors and longtime advocates of education, Mrs. Nancy Humbles. I am grateful for my husband, Carl, and our children, Lydia and Solomon, who are on this journey with me. Along with my faith in Jesus Christ, they are my inspiration. When I was notified of this award, I really didn't know what to feel. Attention isn't something I seek, but I have come to realize how important this time in my life really is and how my example might influence others, particularly women and girls. Right now is right for serving as a role model for impressionable youth, my own children, and so many other young people, particularly black and brown girls who are seeking positive role models. I wanna be a part of the ladder to their success, just like I have had incredible role models along my journey. My family, my friends, colleagues, so many have been instrumental in my development and work ethic and passion for making a difference in our community. I thank the many women in this community who have served as mentors for me. If you're watching and I haven't told you, I hope you know how much you really mean to me. Those mentors have also made a huge difference in how I see the world and the ways in which I maneuver through it. Of course, my husband of 16 years, Carl Cassell, has been my biggest supporter, motivator and inspiration and the way he always challenges me to work smarter and move forward with increased knowledge and wisdom. And I also understand the many ways our children, Lydia and Solomon, teach me new things every day. They are deserving of a legacy of compassion, conviction, and faith. So why women of influence? Male or female, a successful leader is one's ability to influence others. In my current role with the African American Museum of Iowa, I have been blessed with a team of dedicated and passionate professionals who love what they do and who have followed my lead even when my initial steps were baby steps into the world of preservation and exhibition. Often through their lens, I have developed a newfound passion for history, more specifically, educating Iowans about African-American history and achievement. My team has followed me on my visionary journey to foster understanding and appreciation of Iowa's African-American struggle, resilience, and contribution. Because of my role with the museum and in previous positions in this community, I have opportunities to sit at tables, and share my knowledge in decision-making conversations about our community. I can influence those decisions because I don't fear failure, but seek to broaden my own understanding as well as enhance the understanding of others. Former First Lady Michelle Obama said, you can't make decisions based on fear and the possibility of what might happen. What this says to me is that in order to influence others, I have to be willing to take risks and inspire others to do so as well. I can look into the eyes of our children and other black and brown children and assure them that they can do anything they set their minds to. We come from a long line of kings and queens and steadfast warriors. We have stood upon the broad shoulders of those who came before, and I can and must lend my shoulders to those who come behind. I'll end with these verses from Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So thank you again to the Corridor Business Journal Congratulations to my fellow honorees, and thank you. Good night.
Let's give all of this year's honorees another round of applause. You can read more about this year's Women of Influence in the November 9th issue of the Weekly Corridor Business Journal. I do think it's also very important that we thank the spouses, partners, and significant others of this year's honorees. Without their support, it would be very difficult for these leaders to do all the things that they do to make the corridor a special place to live and work. So let's give them another round of applause. I would like to thank our sponsors once again, the University of Iowa Tippie College of Business, Collins Aerospace, and Delta Dental of Iowa. And before we adjourn, I did wanna mention a couple upcoming CBJ events. Coming up on December 8th, we will host our annual cybersecurity event. This live webinar invites industry experts to discuss the current cybersecurity threat landscape, incident response, and tools and tactics to mitigate risks for your company and customers. We're fortunate to have FBI Supervisory Special Agent Ken Schmutz keynoting the address that event, and you can find out more information on that at corridorbusiness.com. And then I also wanted to mention our, our biggest event of the year is traditionally our uh, economic forecast luncheon coming up on January 20th. The economic forecast features a keynote speaker and a panel of local business leaders moderated by Jack Evans, who will provide insight into where the economy is headed and the biggest opportunities and challenges facing their industries and region in the new year. Due to the pandemic, uh, that format of the, that event has been changed to a live webinar. Again, you can register and find out more information on that event and all of our events on our website at quarterbusiness.com. I wanna thank all of you for joining us this evening. Keep reading the weekly Corridor Business Journal and we are adjourned. Have a good night. <laughs>